afternoon. Thanks for tuning in. You're watching Countdown on Bloomberg Quint Live, India's first digital live streaming business news service. I'm Navneet Saluja D'Souza. Well, these are the top headlines at this hour. Markets begin the new week on a negative note as trade tensions resurface. The Nifty and Bank Nifty trade below the 20-day moving average mark while private financials lead the fall. Crude prices have fallen to a five-week low. Oil marketing companies are trading with some bit of gains. ICICI Bank is trading with moderate gains ahead of its fourth quarter numbers. Analysts expect the lender to report better asset quality along with jump in its net profit. And Bharti Airtel 2 is trading with moderate gains ahead of its fourth quarter earnings. India's second largest telecom operator is likely to report a loss this time around while ARPUs are likely to improve. Good afternoon, Neeraj. While we breached the 11,600 mark briefly in the morning because of tension, straight tensions between US China, I think for the last 5 to 10 minutes now we've been trading below the mark of 11,600, which is not a great sign. Which is not a great sign. I think there are two conversations in the market today, Navneet, through my mind at least. One is because of the global tensions, what happens to Indian markets, and because of what's happened to consumption, what's happening to these stocks within. Because as we will talk about it, I'm sure Navneet and Devina both will highlight these uh, that while we Looking at the Nifty being down a percent, the largest story during the day is playing out. It's what's happening to consumption companies, which will now come out in numbers. The Titans, the Maricos of the world, all of these are correcting and under pressure. But as I said, we'll talk about them in moments from now. Uh, bring up the, the mid cap and the small cap indices too. The Nifty is down about a percent, the Bank Nifty is down about a percent, so no quite no big changes there. The mid caps and the small caps too haven't really broken down uh, too much. They just come out lying quiet at about a three quarters of a percent in the red. But the heat map will show you that there is enough and more pain at uh, in the large cap space and a lot of stocks have lost out. So yes, bank, you could argue that you would, one would have anticipated some piece of this news as well, but the stock continues to grind lower. So a couple of days of being in the green and down 5%. The bigger story is out here, what's happening to consumption names. So Titan, uh, you would argue that Tata Motors, JSW, Hindalco are falling because of global reasons and not necessarily domestic reasons, but they are down too. Uh, but Titan is down at the broad end of the spectrum. A bunch of other names have come off. And today, financials and heavyweights have corrected. Look out here. HDFC is down about 2.5%. Axis Bank about a percent and a half. Reliance Industries and HDFC Bank are down about a percent and a half. So heavyweights have corrected today. They've gone down and stayed lower. And that's been the problem point. What's done well? Um, interestingly, IT is done well. After two days of continuous falling and sharp falls, IT is not done too badly today. Uh, quite interesting as to what TCS is doing right now. I would have thought in the morning that that index too could be under pressure, but not quite. BPCL moves up. I, I, I would reckon that the market would believe that if indeed the trade uh, stress is going to come back, then the, the perception of demand for crude might go down and therefore crude prices might correct. Maybe that is what is playing out in these stocks. I see no other reason why they would do that. And ICICI Bank, I of the numbers is uh, mildly in the green but the larger story as i said is what's happening to consumption and what's happened to globally exposed names the jsw's hindalco's tata steels and tata motors of the world but uh, consumption devina right down there not just in the large cap space stocks like titan but even at the broader end of the spectrum a clutch of stocks falling yeah marico uh, being case in point the other ones obviously are how individual stocks have reacted so while the breadth of the market is still negative it opened negative in a big way one is to four uh, in favor of the declines in the morning Individual stocks which have done well in results have managed to maintain those gains even uh, at the fag end of trade right now. So we'll start off with those result reactions which have been positive and the markets have taken it well. So uh, coming straight up first is Birla Corp, a really strong steady set of numbers coming in from the counter and it's been rewarded. So the stock's up closer to about 4, 4.5, 5% right now. Aside from that, a federal bank and a Deepak Nitride, two strong stocks and the markets have duly rewarded both these counters. Losing out in trade, uh, uh, we've got a few stocks, but I'll come to that in a bit. Tara Chemicals, Lakshmi Vilas Bank and PC Jewelers are a few other names that are doing strong in the session. Those are results reactions up on your screen. Other movers in trade, Tata Chemicals also on the back of a strong number. So that's up 8.5% in intraday trade right now. And you've got the others following suit. Volume buzzers and Avas Financiers, this is also trading near its 52-week high right now. So along with the fact that it's traded uh, heavy volumes, it's also near its highs. Idea Cellular ahead. Uh, of Bharti Etel's numbers, that one is doing well. And you've got a Reliance Capital, a uh, steep cut on the stock and heavy volumes on the downside. So that's not looking all that good. Other big losers, 
Reliance Home Finance loses out. Divan Housing Finance tumbles about five, five and a half percent. And Amadus and Sumi also looks equally weak. That's down about five and a half percent. What's at its 52 week lows or near thereabouts is uh, one signed and Amar Raja battery as uh, that's down uh, in the session as well. But it's just three points away from a new 52 week low for Amar Raja. So we're going to watch out for all of these stocks as we progress into the last uh, one and a half hour of trade. But what's happening in the futures and options space in the more liquid universe? Namely, it's going to highlight that for us. Namely. Thanks for that, Devina. Well, if you look at the future side, both Nifty as well as the Bank Nifty, first of all, the index has been trading below its 20-day moving average right from the word go in the morning as we had a gap down opening coming about. So um, the volatility today has been really on the higher side. I think India VIX is once again at three to three and a half year high. Last when I checked, it was trading with gains of almost... Uh, uh, 9 percent or so. Okay, that, those are nifty futures for you. Open interest is up 5 percent. 11 percent higher now for India Wix, which is telling you that there could be more volatility coming ahead. Pull up the bank nifty futures and check whether there is any sort of uh, build up on the open interest side, which has come about. Remember from the start of the series, first there was some unwinding. First signs of addition definitely came in on Friday. Yes, 12 percent higher for bank nifty futures open interest and premiums is somewhere about 150 points. Quickly on the option side, so far the maximum open interest was the 11,800 call and the 11,700 put and that was the time we were looking out for a range of 11,650 to 850. That range has come down now. Today we've breached the 11,600 mark. In fact the maximum open interest now on the put side has moved from 11,700 to 600. If you go by the premiums today once again I think the cap now on the upside is at the 11,700 as the 11,650 strike has added a lot of open interest call writing visible at 650 and the 11,700 strike. Also on the put side, meager addition I would call it at 11,600 strike which has added 6 lakh shares. So on the upside, watch out for 11,700 and from here we're already trading. I think 11,550, 500 will be key because that was a level which was tested multiple times in the April series. Moving on to a couple of stock futures, ICICA Bank will be in focus. The bank reports its earnings today and uh, the stock options today of ICICA Bank have become really active. No major build up on the future side. So most active strikes are 380 put and 410 call strike. Particularly today, the 380 put has added almost 38 lakh shares. Look at the premium, it's 9 rupees. So that's telling you the downside probably could be limited to 370. Uh, maybe the traders don't expect the stock to fall below that mark. But stock's just 2% away, by the way, from its 52-week higher levels of 411. So going into numbers, not a bad day for ICICI Bank. Marico is the other one. We've seen the consumption stocks disappointing. And just ahead of the numbers, 4% lower. Traders shorting this counter. 15% higher when it comes to open interest. And interestingly, I just saw Strides Pharma, that stock saw open interest surge of about 21 to 22%, 4.5% lower for this one too. I think the numbers come out this week on Friday, so watch out for this. And Tara Chemical, the numbers were better than what a couple of brokerages were at least expecting on back of which we've seen moves of almost 8%. Fresh long positions have been seen with OI surging nearly 16%. All right, that's uh, a whole list of stocks that we need to watch out for as we go towards close. But um, what has spooked the markets is all, or you know, since morning has been the global sentiment and uh, specific tweets with regards uh, to the trade talks by uh, President Trump and the fact that Friday could be the day where another $200 billion worth of Chinese goods could attract tariffs as much as 25%. Bring in a global voice then, Richard Harris of Port Shelter Investment Management is joining us on the show this afternoon. Uh, Richard, thanks very much for taking out the time. Let's get in a sense from you as to, you know, this is definitely a big shakeup in terms of the uh, global equities. And, you know, one tweet that has been put out by the president has really uh, probably, the sentiment has turned around for the worse. And just a few days ago, in fact, there were talks of the trade conversations going on as per plan. Uh, yes, I mean, it is rather confusing, but this should be part of the uh, Donald Trump playbook, you know, which is to keep your opponent guessing, and especially in terms of negotiation. Um, I suspect the talks uh, haven't been going as well as they might, um, uh, partly because, you, you know, when you hear reports of trade talks and this sort of thing, they're typically not going to be negative. 
Um, most of the talk was likely to be positive. Um, but behind the scenes, it's quite likely they haven't been going as well as Donald Trump would like. And um, maybe he's just woken up in the middle of the night and had a fit of pique and, and fired off this message, which is actually quite serious. The other aspect, obviously, that could, you know, uh, probably uh, spook the markets is what's been happening to crude oil. And there, too, uh, we've got uh, President Trump playing a major role uh, in spooking sentiment. So uh, while on one hand we're talking about, you know, Saudi Arabia and, you know, them taking over the shortfall that comes in from Iran, the, the, the problem lies with what happens thereafter and whether or not after filling the gap of Iran, Saudi Arabia has any incremental capacity left to deal with issues if they do arise from Libya, Venezuela. So all these issues kept in mind, uh, crude oil being another major factor that equity market watchers are keeping an eye out on. Well, I think it's one factor, but... Um, uh, it, it's you, you know, Donald Trump is not really talking about joined up uh, discussion here. You know, he'll say one thing about one market and one thing about another. Um, uh, now, China and Hong Kong have reacted quite strongly today, but other markets haven't reacted quite as badly. When I last looked, Europe was down around 1% or so. Um, remember that the market is now getting used to Donald Trump's tweets. They're now getting used to the fact that he barks more than he bites, um, and he has to in this situation. So there must be some question about whether the markets are going to fully take this on board. Um, if you take 25% fully on board, I think that's really quite a negative feature. You know, 10% can be hidden in exchange rate movements, in uh, companies taking a hit on the margin, this kind of thing. 25% is inescapable. Um, and it's also quite a strong declaration of war in trade terms. So I think that's, uh, that's pretty bad. I rather suspect that the oil price is going to follow that as a piece of news rather than supply and demand factors in the short term between uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia and Venezuela and these other places. So I think we should look at the oil price really as being a function of what's happening uh, with the trade talks first. Uh, and lesser so than a, a supply and demand situation, which after all is fairly constant. But, you know, uh, your point well taken, but uh, when the barking can do this amount of damage, you know, you don't need a bite coming in that can do worse uh, for the overall markets. But just to get in a sense from you, uh, emerging markets and the flows have been strong so far. Does this hamper that in terms of the foreign money? Uh yeah, I, I, I think it does. You know, this is quite a serious uh, issue, I think, all in all. Um, uh, and I think that the bark is quite serious, and central bankers, of course, find that out for themselves. Um, but I think one of the issues is that um, uh, we are going to see um, uh, a real concern with this 25%. Um, I suspect Friday will come and go uh, without the 25% being imposed. You know, Trump will find another reason to delay it. Um, but I think we should look at it as part of his negotiating tactics. He is willing to do it uh, if that, that happens. But I think that generally uh, it's really a threat rather than something serious. But the markets have to take their face value. And at the moment, I think they're taking it reasonably at face value with some discounting. Okay. All right. Uh, Richard, just one final question. Do you reckon that global commodities could remain under extended pressure if indeed there is no resolution uh, coming about uh, US and China in the near term? Well, I think obviously the danger with the US and China is that it's going to impact global trade and global trade and global economies will be affected and that too is going to uh, hinder the commodity uh, situation. Now, uh, of course, for India, this is generally quite good as, a, as an importer of commodities. Um, but of course, slowing demands uh, elsewhere in the world are not good. Uh, you know, that is an issue. So I think that really we're in a situation where um, uh, the markets are in some turmoil. Uh, they're not much different than they were last week. But broadly, we've seen a very big rally. We're knocking around all-time highs in the U.S. There probably needs to be some excuse for them to come back. And I think we'll see markets come back, and I think we'll see buying opportunities come through. Uh, but I wouldn't be buying for a couple of weeks. Okay. 
Uh, Richard, leave it at that. Thanks so much for taking the time out and joining us and giving us that perspective. Uh, Thank you. That's the view from Port Shelter. But it's interesting, guys. I mean, and, and I don't know if anybody will be able to tell us over the next few days mm. whether or not this is a good time to buy, uh, accumulate, sell, uh, because the situation is unclear, right? Until Saturday, nobody quite anticipated this. And suddenly Donald Trump was at his best again. Yeah, so far I think we were only looking at the domestic factors. Suddenly now once again the global factors have come into play. And uh, I think there was a meeting this week between the officials of both US and China. And as certain reports are now suggesting that meeting may not take place after his tweet. But tariff increase from 10 to 25 percent speaks lots. Yeah. China has anyway said that they're looking to back out from this uh, particular conversation. Yeah, I, I don't know. If, is it official? I don't know. I, I read some reports which suggested that they might do this. But I don't know. Yeah, they just report and uh, yeah. no, no confirmation may have come in. But I think the bigger question here is what sort of collateral damage it can have to market like India. We've seen the steel companies falling, uh, whether there'll be a threat of prices falling because it's going to where, where will China dump the steel production if it cannot export it to US? Yeah. And nonetheless, overall, since the economy itself will get hurt, it hurts demand. So if your demand gets gets hurt, all the other industries in a way uh, get, feel the, the, the heat of it. Yeah, so that is one factor. The other factor, of course, uh, would be uh, for the markets as we were talking about is the internal uh, slowdown that comes in uh, from the consumption side uh, and previously restricted to autos. But as we said at the start of the show, what stocks like Marico, what stocks like Titan are showing is that the market is worried. Now, the interesting bit is Titan, when they came out with their quarterly update, mentioned that all was hunky-dory with quarter four. And irrespective of what happened to the industry, they would grow at the historical rates. Even if they didn't, if there were fears about what will happen to quarter four, those should be unfounded. But I reckon because of all that's happened uh, to uh, the other companies, some people might be thinking that multiples by and large of some of the consumption names might be put under question mark. And I, I see that as the only probable reason why a titan would come down because this one is growing at everybody else's expense in the jewelry space and it will continue to show growth. So this has to be not an earnings related pullback, if at all, it is fundamental in nature, but a multiples related pullback. Uh, that's mm -hmm. probably uh, the only factor why I see titan coming yeah. off. I can understand the others doing that. You know, Neeraj, this was the only company in the jewellery space which benefited from G G GST or demonetization because of shift in market share from unorganized to organized market. So, as you rightly mentioned, I think the entire consumption space is trading at high valuations of 45, 50 times, and I think Titan also trades around those marks. So, this could be a correction in PE multiples, though there is slowdown, which majority of the management so far have indicated, but whether it turns out to be protract, protracted period of slowdown. The management of GCPL said no, they expect some bit of turnaround. I think the major factor will be now a stable government coming in and also monsoon. If that falls in place, maybe the, cons uh, the demand comes back. The root, you know, the very important commentary from HUL came in. The rural growth, which used to be higher than urban growth this time, it was at par. So mm. that, uh, that in itself said, because the entire space depends on the rural growth. Yeah, and, and you know, I was doing this small interaction with uh, uh, JM Financial when they did that rural safari and they mentioned in their note and their commentary that their analysis seemed to suggest that a lot of demand ahead of elections will come in post elections so post elections according to them in the months of June and July there will be a bit of a spurt yeah. uh, when it comes to consumption so let's wait and watch if all of that happens or no but well lots to focus on the market let's try and do that uh, because it's not just consumption. Uh, Nanit is also what's happening uh, to earnings and a couple of large earnings later to come out today. Yep, I think uh, we're talking about Bharti Airtel. Let's see how the quarter turns out. But if you go by what the analysts are expecting, it, it is expected that it will be a subdued quarter for Bharti Airtel. That's India's second largest telecom operator, which is likely to report a loss in the March quarter with margins likely to be flat. Somit Sarkar joins us with what to expect from the earnings this time around. Somit, if I'm not mistaken, I think last two quarters also there was an expectation of posting a loss, but they did post a profit. And the number to be watched out will be the ARPU figure, right? 
Exactly. In the last two quarters, also analysts were expecting the company to report a loss, but due to some adjustments, uh, the company did manage to report a profit. So that's actually not the number that one should watch out for. One should actually watch out for the India mobile performance and the average revenue per user number that comes in. However, on a consolidated basis, if we see compared to last quarter, the numbers are expected to be flattish. The revenue is expected to come in at close to 20,600 crore rupees. The EBITDA is expected to come in at close to 6,300 crore rupees. Margins are expected to be flattish at around 30.5 percent, while the company is expected to report a net loss of close to 1000 crore rupees. Now the key number for Airtel would be the average revenue per user that is expected to be 15% higher compared to last quarter to close to 120 rupees. Now uh, the growth in ARPU is because of the full impact of the minimum recharge plans because of which there would be further subscriber losses also because of 4G subscriber additions and because of fewer days in the quarter that will be aiding the company's ARPU in the fourth quarter of financial year 2019. Overall if you see for the India business the growth is expected to come back mainly because of the more data users that the company has added in the fourth quarter. Quarter. Now the subscriber number if you see for India business it is expected to decline to nearly 27.6 crore versus 28.4 crore what the company reported in the third quarter of financial year 2019. However if the fall in subscriber base is much higher than anticipated then optically if you see the ARPU number would show a good growth but overall the numbers would still be weak because of the fall in subscriber base. Now uh, along with this if you see the non-mobile businesses they are expected to be a drag on the India mobile operations. Now the fixed line and or the broadband business or the DTH business is expected to report a quarter on quarter revenue decline because of competition and because of uh, the implementation of TRI's new tariff orders. On a consolidated basis, if you see the numbers could still surprise our, uh, and come ahead of the analyst estimate, but that would be mainly because of a strong performance that the company reported for the Africa business. Now, as against analyst expectations, the uh, Africa business reported a strong set of numbers. The EBITDA from the Africa business increased uh, despite the uh, Q4 being a seasonally weak quarter, so that could aid the overall consolidated numbers of Bharti Airtel. Now, key things to watch out for from Bharti Airtel earnings would include the rate of 4G subscriber additions that the company has reported in the fourth quarter along with that their FY20 capital expenditure guidance, any uh, management commentary on asset monetization plans and any management commentary on tariff hikes would be important to watch out for from Bharti Airtel earnings today. Thanks for that, Samit. So uh, on to Tata Chemicals which has seen its biggest intraday surge since August 2016 after its fourth quarter results. Yashupal is here to Tell us what stood out in these numbers. Yes. Good, good afternoon, Meera. Just so it was a steady quarter as far as the numbers are concerned, but uh, multiple reasons behind the sort of move that we've seen. Primarily, the fact that they are expanding into several new products uh, and uh, the management commentary as well in terms of outlook. But starting first with their revenues, uh, they have seen an eight percent growth on a year-on-year -year basis, coming in at about two thousand seven hundred and fifty-nine crore rupees. Net profit was down sixty-five percent, but that was mainly on account of the eight hundred and fifty crore rupees that the company earned uh, via the sale of its fertilizer business to Yara Fertilizers. EBITDA was up 3.5%, but EBITDA margins came off about 1.5%, and that was mainly on account of the higher power and fuel costs. Uh, net profit uh, came in slightly higher than was some of the brokerage reports that I'm reading were suggesting, and that was mainly uh, because of the 46 crore rupees in deferred tax gain that the company had in the current quarter, uh, which resulted in their effective tax rate coming down from 9% uh, plus to about 6.3% in the quarter. Uh, but coming to their geographical, geographical performance, it was primarily the domestic revenues uh, which stood out wherein they have posted a 25% growth on a year-on-year -year basis aided by the higher volumes and improved realizations in the soda ash as well as the sodium bicarbonate miss this. Uh, both the United States as well as Africa business have posted strong strong growth again on account of improved realizations as well as high capacity utilization but Europe uh, continues to remain a cause of concern for the company uh, as lower sales and higher energy and fixed costs hurt the business there. In terms of the segmental revenue basic chemicals business that posted a 13 and a half percent growth on a year-on-year -year basis uh, which uh, on the other hand uh, their largest the highest growth came in the consumer products business which saw a 19 percent growth coming in at about 479 crore rupees now this was mainly on account of the new launches that the company took in the in the snacks as well as the detergents business uh, the new detergents they have uh, they are running on a pilot in West Bengal and the response seems to be very positive according to the company in terms of the expansion plan uh, they are are coming up with a new unit in Nellore, uh, which according to the company is in the final stages of commissioning, as well as uh, their silica, specialty silica uh, unit, which is coming up in Kodalore, which again, according to the company, is going as planned and would be commissioned uh, in the first half of FI20 itself. So all in all, uh, decent set of numbers, but the management continues to remain very positive in terms of outlook and the aggressive expansion plan that they have in the consumer products business. Thanks for that, Yash. Um 
so that's one set of numbers which look oh, which look good and the stock is reacting let's see let's pull up the stock price of ptc india financial services uh, um, because those numbers too optically at least look uh, good it was back uh, in the black reporting a net profit of 36 crores compared to a loss in the same quarter last year asset quality too showed a marginal improvement on a sequential basis at least let's discuss the quarter gone by with pawan singh he's the managing director of pdc india financial services mr singh good having you thanks much for joining in uh, put this quarter into perspective the nii uh, didn't have material growth but your asset quality is improved and the bottom line performance uh, looks fairly healthy Yeah, so uh, NII, of course, one reason for that is that uh, you're bottoming it out because a lot of uh, our stress assets for which we have done uh, quite a bit of provisioning uh, this year and uh, we have increased our provisioning ratio to over 50% from 30%. And also what happened is that we have stopped recognizing income on stress assets. So that is one of the reasons playing on the NII. But then, of course, we have a baseline where you have probably seen that a nice, uh, you know, downside would be uh, bottom route. Uh, as far as uh, uh, other stress assets are uh, concerned, you can see that there has been some improvement on the uh, gross as well as net NPA, and we'll continue to focus and uh, resolve our stress assets wherever uh, uh, a balance amount net of provisioning is available. Uh, what is very uh, redeeming for us is that this year, uh, because we came out of uh, the loss which we had made and uh, we are back on our normal business as usual model uh, with a you know, clean baseline. And uh, that is why to repose that uh, confidence, we have declared a dividend of 8% and a dividend payout ratio of over 30%, which uh, since I have said that we have, uh, we have a, a clean baseline to s start with, will. Uh, be able to maintain this kind of uh, 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 ratio in future as well. Uh, you know, also I'd like to point here is that we still continue to maintain a very healthy capital adequacy at 21%, which gives us cushion to expand in future. Uh, we uh, have uh, about 10 years of experience now in the renewable space. And uh, let me share with you, you know, we have uh, almost uh, nil uh, NPAs as far as the renewable space is concerned. So we'll continue to focus in the renewable space. There is a lot of policy support coming from the government and government has to meet uh, the climate change uh, challenges. So it will. it is a sector where uh, the growth will happen and will try to be the part of the growth story as we have been in past. Right. Uh, Mr. Singh, a follow-up. We follow focus just a or place ourselves as a... No, Mr. Singh, if I can just intervene here, just a small uh, follow-up question to that. Uh, you have mentioned in your release as well that you will continue to grow in the renewable sector. Unlike uh, the previous decade at least, the last year or 18 odd months have seen serious stress within the renewable projects as well. Uh, while hitherto it's not shown in your books or in other people's books, do you reckon that it could start looking a bit different in the next 12 months? Because we have seen projects uh, going off-grid, so to say. No, see, uh, here also it would, you know, one does not go blindly into all renewable projects. We have to be selective and choosy. And we have a robust uh, appraisal system, and uh, our appraisal is based on a high degree of risk assessment. Uh, so we build in margins both for cash flows because one of the challenges is counterparty risk in renewable. So we build in working capital and uh, you know, debt service support uh, margins into our appraisal system. We also do uh, CEF analysis at a very, very uh, conservative level. So that is one of the reasons, not entirely because that the sector is fantastic, but one has to do uh, quite a bit of cherry picking while one goes ahead. So our comfort is coming from there, but then growth is going to happen here. And one more uh, area which is opening up in renewable space is that we are now getting uh, counterparties, third-party PPA and uh, ca group captive uh, renewable uh, projects where uh, the counterparty is not the state government but high uh, credit worthy customers like Ashok Leyland and you have Nestle and you have Infosys and so on. So this is an area which is growing up in a big way which doesn't also have a tariff constraint and uh, normally uh, a lot of uh, private equity is flowing into this area from outside India. 
and this is a space we have already started uh, actively and we would be continuing to look, uh, look at this space. Apart from renewable, because renewable is part of sustainable uh, finance and sure. we have positioned ourselves in a, to a great extent uh, as a sustainable finance company. And some of the areas which would come up like waste to energy, waste to SBG right. gas, that is waste to CNG gas, which sure, is uh, Government of India is promoting in a big way. Right. And uh, we, we were the first one to do recently the uh, sewage treatment plant right. uh, for Adani Enterprises uh, 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 under the annuity model. So city gas distribution, uh, electrical vehicle charging, charging stations, these are sure. the areas we would be focusing on. Yeah, so if, if they're taking all of this into account, sir, my final question, um, what do you think FY20 as a year could look like? One, ballpark estimates of where your asset quality could be because you've reduced your gross NPS to around 6%. Can you improve them further? And two, any thoughts on any estimates about what the NI numbers or the year-end um, uh, other other numbers could look like some flavor of what the year would be in numerical terms. So I will not be able to give you exact number where we will reach, but as I have said at the beginning only that we have a base under which you know uh, the NI number would be uh, a pure business related NI number, and it would not be you know NI number where surprises from left and right and center would come because we have taken care of most of our stress assets. So it will be business as usual. So I said we have started from a base and it could be incremental and on, uh, uh, on a positive direction. What about the NPAs? NPAs, uh, as I've said, that we have made uh, more than 50% provisioning based on our assessment of uh, you know what will be the expected credit loss. Uh, and then uh, we have embarked upon many resolution strategies. Some of it are almost towards, uh, uh, you know, may happen in a quarter or so. Some of them may take maybe two to three, three quarters. But going forward, we feel that except one blip here and there, but if I look at medium term or maybe long term, our NPA numbers will fall down. All right, uh, Mr. Singh, we leave it at that. Thank you so very much for joining us and speaking to us about your quarterly performance there. So while they have uh, gone slow this time, uh, overall uh, financials look uh, at par. In fact, the profit numbers have been positive. Asset quality has improved. Stocks up about 3.5%. Bringing in our market experts then, we've got Hemen Kapadia of KR Choksi who's joining us on the show. Along with him, Shubham Agarwal joins us on the technicals as well from Quonsap.com. And on our fundamentals, we've got Samir Kalra of Target Investing who's joining us on the show too. Uh, I'm going to start off first with the technicals. And Hemen, I'll start off with you first on the index. Um, we all have uh, you know, placed the support level closer to 11,550. That's the area where on multiple occasions the nifty has bounced back from so what which direction would your trade now lie on i think for the last couple of weeks it's been almost boring devina i think uh, 11 550 11 6 is what the range we're looking at and if you look at the options data 11 5 and 12000 and i think uh, the oi is ridiculously low i think uh, on friday's closing the option OI on the 12,000 call, on maximum call was around 12 point something lakhs, which was earlier used to be 40, 45, and a year ago 85, 90 lakhs. So it's obvious markets are light. The future uh, uh, OI is not that light, but the option is ridiculously light. So I guess people don't want to take a position and markets are reflecting that. And the VIX is at 26 and a half. Last time the election in 2015, the VIX went to 36. We went to peak at 39. Mm. So there's a lot more for the VIX to go. We remained in a large range between 11, 5 and 12. Multiple threats to break down on either side haven't proved, have been unsuccessful. So one, we're not going anywhere. Two, it's going to be a listless market. And three, as elections come close. So you don't necessarily force a trade on the market? No, I'd sell the 11, 5, put 10, 12 call, which I have been selling for the last two weeks. And But the week is, go, is going up, will go up more. So frankly speaking, uh, it's a zero-sum game. I would not, I would be reticent about doing especially anything one would just stay away. Okay. Shubham Agarwal is also there with us. Shubham, what's your strategy on the index? Hi, good afternoon, Devina. 
Uh, on Friday, we did discuss that uh, the market uh, looks negative and uh, roughly around 11,800, uh, we uh, uh, recommended a trade to go short on Nifty on your show. Uh, now, for people who have already taken that call are in the money by 150 points, and I feel that uh, the target that was initiated on that day was 11,650 was the first target and the second, uh, second target was 11,600 on the Nifty futures. So the first target is already done. I would uh, recommend that, you know, people can hold on to the shorts, if any, uh, for the second target of 11,600. Now, if you look at the options data, 11,700, 800 is a very heavy congestion uh, from the call writing perspective. And I think that, you know, that level should not get surpassed immediately. And on the downside, at least 11,600 on the Nifty futures should get retested. And we might also have a probability of going below that. But for now, 11,600 is the target. Uh, I would recommend to hold on to the shorts with the trailing stop loss at 11,725. Okay, those are the call coming in on the index. Shubham, let me also take your stock specific ideas for this afternoon. What are the stocks that you're recommending either on the long or on the short side? Yeah, in fact, there are two calls, one on the long and one on the short side. So I would first uh, start with uh, the selling idea. Uh, so I recommend a short on uh, ACC, and if you look at this overall space, uh, the, the entire uh, cement space has now come to a pause, and we are witnessing some unwinding happening there. Uh, so we might see some more acceleration on the downside in ACC. So one can look to go short for a target of 1570, then a stop loss at 1660. And uh, the second call is a buy call on BPCL, and uh, if you look at the overall oil marketing companies, that is actually doing well, and BPCL is leading today. And this is also a breakout happening on the uh, slightly medium term chart. And I feel that, uh, you know, on the other side, on the contrary view, uh, some of the oil marketing companies can actually continue to do it. So BPCL is a buy for a target of 410, the stop loss at 378. I mean, you're not taking call on the index, but stock specific? Yes, I think a couple of stocks. Uh, uh, no need. I think uh, LIT Housing Finance deeply oversold uh, volume has hit um, what 20 30 trading session high and we still on as far as the day is concerned so buy on lic housing finance 485 stop loss 477 target 501 and the uh, other one is a is a slightly high risk one it's graphite uh, i'm just playing for a bounce buy in graphite at uh, okay it's already down so i'd like to tweak the figures a bit buy at 395 stop loss 385 target 415 Okay, um, those are two buy calls coming in from him in. We've also got Samir Kalra right here in the studio. Samir, the sentiment has turned negative, but I don't know if the day belongs to you. Are you buying anything at lower levels because you're a contra buyer, right? Uh, yeah, I am a contra buyer. That's <laughs> stock specific, but I've created around 35% cash now. Okay. Uh, because I believe whatever happens, uh, even if the majority government, whatever the outcome is, we are coming to the place where reality, you know, uh, hits the markets. So which stocks are you looking at at lower levels? So I'm looking at uh, BHL. I'm looking at, uh, right now, if you see uh, Bajaj Auto, these are not lower levels. But ONGC, I'm adding up. So these three stocks are mainly the additional incremental buys as of now. Okay. Uh, the push pull back that we're seeing in some of the consumption name stocks, yeah. is this... Uh, a multiple pullback in stocks like Titan, yeah. Marico, etc. And if so, would you believe that there could be more pain? Or would you use that pain to go out and buy? So I think the pain has just started uh, mm -hmm. because we were traveling on very low basis and there was a lot of GST uh, impact in the base and then demonetization. And now that double digit growth which consumer staples was showing, at least on the staple side, I think that is over. Uh, that might go into the lower single digits or even somewhere going very difficult phases where the volume growth might Why? be going negative. Because if you see what was happening, there were two impacts. One, the GST introduction was re leading to a, a kind of a rejig at the distribution level. Hmm. So regional products were being outsold and uh, distributors were buying in uh, into national branded products. So they were giving a higher margins over there as well and the GST filing and getting the rebate was much more easier. So that shifting or that increase at market share at the distributor level has happened. Now if you see the retail outlet expansion hasn't taken place past six to nine months. 
So now your growth at a volume growth is only led by two. Either you add a new distributor or you add a new retail outlet, which hasn't happened for six to nine months in any retail, any consumer staple company. Or demand picks up post elections. See, demand, what happens to demand if it picks up? See, elections have no, nowhere, uh, I think, a connect with a soap sale. Mm. That's not the whole phenomena. We were talking about, you know, the... Staples. Okay, staples, sure. right? Mm. I'm talking about the staples, whether you call Dabur or a Imami or a HUL. Now, these are getting on a higher base, volume base. Now, growing a 10% or a 7% or 17% until unless your base is smaller will become impossible at a certain point. Because if you see HUL for because past three size. years, because no, HUL... So, so in, in that, that effect then, yeah. Samir, you are saying that a high volume trajectory is gone, right? Because the base so will only keep on going larger. So, so it's gone for a short to medium term from my point December, of December, the base will be higher even if they grow at a very low pace, right? No, that's what I'm saying. So it's gone for the short to medium term from my side. It's gone for next one year. I think so next we, four we, quarters, I don't see any revival in these kind of volume growths kicking in. There was that benign base so far, Neeraj, I think, which we were talking about. Because, because 16, volume growth was 10%, 11%. Look at HOL's volume growth, CAGA, last three years. It's actually 7% what they've yeah. posted now. So it's, it's returning to normalcy, I would call it. Yeah, but the base only keeps on going higher, right? Even if the volume growth happens only 2%. No, that is still see, an addition to the saying. previous base. So that's what I'm saying. That base, which is going higher at 15%, 15 or 14 percent or 13 percent that was due to your base getting impacted or your distributors getting impacted okay so essentially you get out of all of the consumption names that we have in your portfolio yeah so i was getting out before uh, last quarter itself i would suggest any bounces from here on get out of them or lighten them all right, uh, uh, that is the call on consumption staples, at least from uh, uh, Samir Kalra, and he believes that probably look at getting out of uh, some of them uh, for the time being, at least in the near term. Not much of a bigger move expected thereabouts. ICICI Bank, there was one stock and should pull it up ahead of its numbers, what it's doing. It's absolutely flat, but it's come off the day's lows, not bad going at all. Uh, expectations with regards to ICICI Bank and the numbers thereof is that they're looking at a big profit number in the fourth quarter, primarily on the back of their focus on the retail side and a moderation with regards to corporate loan growth. Shefali Malik, she's standing by and she's got... Uh, uh, details of what the market is priced in with regards to ICICI Bank's numbers, Shefali. Well, we're factoring in net interest income figure of about 7192 crore rupees. That'll be a growth of roughly 19% on a YOY basis and profit figure of about 2292 crore rupees. That'll be a growth of about 124% on a YOY basis. So we're looking forward to a loan growth of about 14%, which will primarily be driven by the retail book. And the corporate book is expected to continue to decline in this quarter as well. Deposits growth are seen at about 13%, mainly driven by the term deposits. Also will be interesting to look forward to their CASA accretion this time around, considering the crunch that the system is facing with regards to the deposits. As far as asset quality is concerned, the incremental stress addition is likely to go down uh, from this quarter onwards, and the watch list uh, loans will also expected is also expected to decline on a sequential basis. Their uh, gross NPS, we are factoring in a figure of about 7.5% versus 7.75% on a sequential basis, and the net stressed um, book was about 6.8% of the total loans at the end of the third quarter so from that level it's, it's expected to pare down even further uh, other income is also expected to grow by about six percent on a sequential basis some of the banks have seen an increase in the fee income in a, on a sequential basis so we look forward to the same in ICSA bank as well and overall very good set of earnings are expected from ICSA bank this time around all right uh, 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 we hope to see some good numbers coming out from the banking space. So right now, the stock at 400 not doing a whole lot much. Shafali, thank you very much for that. Uh, and I'll get to Samir uh, with ICICI Bank in a bit, but I quickly want to go to Shubham and get in some trading ideas on some of these private sector banks. And ICICI Bank being the first one, obviously ahead of numbers, I don't know whether you'd like to take a trade or no, but a broader uh, price outlook on an ICICI Bank, in which direction do you expect it to move? Uh, along with that, even a stock like a Bandhan Bank, um, uh, Shubham. So if you look at ICC Bank, uh, very clearly 395 is a good support and unless and until that support is reached, uh, I think the trend should continue on the positive side. And if you look at the overall uh, banking name, uh, 
uh, this has been one of the all performers and has been consistently trading at uh, a new all time high. So I think uh, ahead of the results, I wouldn't prefer actually uh, forecasting the result, but still if someone wants to go and take a trade, uh, 395 should be the stop loss and on the upside, if uh, we do see a fall of high, uh, then the next target for the same will be roughly around 415 to 418. But if I have to choose the, one of the stocks from uh, a similar space and uh, uh, look for a buying opportunity, I would want to go for DCB Bank because if you look there, uh, there is a continuation pattern getting formed on the chart and this is happening after the stock is now putting at an all-time high. Uh, which is uh, a very good indication that you know very soon we might see a breakout happening, which can lead to a medium term uptrend in the stock. So I would recommend uh, going long on DCB Bank, and uh, that can also be considered at the current market price. Uh, 208 will be the stop loss, and on the upside, 235 will be a positional target for DCB Bank. All right, DCB Bank, in fact, had hit a 52-week high. I think it was about, it's already at its 52-week high, rather. 216 right now post its quarterly performance. Profit after tax had risen 50% for DCB Bank. Uh, Sameer, these private sector banks, and uh, Yes Bank is a different case in point. We're not even going to uh, go there right now. I just want to uh, focus on a few of these names, like a DCB Bank, a Bandhan Bank. Strong numbers, both these yep. names. ICICI Bank is the other big one that's reporting numbers. ICICI Bank, uh, a different case in point being is their retail focus. Now, their ro loan growth of about 13, 14% coming from the retail side, while the corporate book, <laughs> slight moderation. What's the expectation and, and how would you play this space? So I think uh, in private banks, I'll stick with the consistency if you remove uh, underperformers. Uh, if you see DCB Bank, DCB Bank last couple of years have done a lot of branch expansion. So it takes a while for these branches to become profitable. So I think next six to nine months will be good for DCB Bank. And I feel there's another 15 to 20% upside over there in the shorter term. Uh, on the longer term, it still has to show that kind of a performance to get a higher PE and price to book valuations. On the ICICI Bank, I feel that kind of a upside surprise is played out. Now the only thing is they can support the consistency or the estimates and provisioning might be flat out. They won't be higher until and unless they start taking, you know, all these kind of uh, risky accounts into provisions earlier than what they, everyone estimates. That will be the only negative surprise in the system. Otherwise, I don't see much change because still the corporate book rules the NPS. So mm. retail can provide the, you know, kind of a growth, but NIMS will be controlled by the corporate oh. books only. Can I throw in the Federal Bank there? The numbers look pretty good. So Federal Bank, the concentration is such that if two or three big accounts get uh, sorted out or the recovery happens, the re results come out to be very good. It has to be consistently performing in that way so that the whole portfolio is getting a recovery. So I think this quarter I give them that they have got a better numbers, but I'll still wait for a couple of quarters to see that consistency in the NPA drop. Okay, uh, that's the view coming in on the banking space. And Federal Bank, of course, it's up in trade after its quarterly earnings where asset quality improvement was seen. Provisions for the quarter was also on the lower side. All right, since we're talking about earnings, Orient Paper reported its fourth quarter numbers last week. Uh, while there was some tax reversal which aided the bottom line growth this time around, but if you look at the operating performance, the margins remained flat. Let's uh, get more details as to uh, what contributed to the top line of 9% uh, this time around. We're joined by by Mr. Emil Pachisia, the managing director of the company. Hi, Mr. Pachisia. Good afternoon to you, and thanks a lot for joining us today on Bloomberg Quinn. First up, uh, if you could tell us 9% top line growth, how much would you attribute it to volume growth and how much due to prices? Uh, the growth is driven by two factors. One is the uh, some volume increase on the tissue side. And, uh, of course, there is a price in, in, in improvement also. If you could just uh, give us uh, some numbers uh, out of the 9%, what was the volume growth? And this this mean that you if I'm not mistaken, last quarter there were no price increase which was seen. No, there was no price increase. Last quarter there was no price increase. The price increase happened much earlier. I was talking for the year. For the last quarter, it is basically volume increase. 9% is volume-led growth. 
That's right. Okay. So in the current quarter, are we seeing any increase in prices, sir, uh, or it's still stable? The prices are stable. There is no further increase. Okay, uh, going to your operating performance, uh, last quarter you had given a guidance that margins will be somewhere about 19 to 19 and a half percent. But I think sequentially and also in year on year basis, there has been some decline owing to cost of raw materials as a percentage. There also, uh, the, that percentage has gone up to almost 28.5 percent. Give us a sense as to what transpired during the quarter, and do we see more input cost pressures in the present quarter as well? No, I don't know from uh, how you have calculate the margins. The margins have actually improved. 18.6%, sir? The margins have improved. The costs have come down. So No, of course, the margins have improved on year on year basis. It's in 19.4 versus 16.5. I'm yeah. talking about the quarter gone by. Yes, quarter gone by for the fourth quarter also. If you compare with the same quarter last year, the margins have improved. Okay, no, they appear to be stable. All right, we'll uh, check on that. It's, it was 18.8%, I guess, in the corresponding quarter. But nevertheless, then give us a sense on pulp prices. I think they were going up. They came off in the third quarter. W w how are the pulp prices now shaping up? They're stable. They're stable but now. Anyway, we, we import only between 10 to 12 percent of our pulp requirement. The rest of the pulp is made by in-house. Okay. You touched upon the tissue segment. I think that contributes nearly 40 to 45 percent to your top line. If you could tell us, how is the demand there and what sort of growth one can expect in the upcoming quarter? Tissue uh, market in India is growing in double-digit rates mm -hmm. for the last few years and continues to do so this year as well. Okay. Uh, of course, 50% of our total volume we are exporting. 50% of the total uh, tissue volume? Tissue, tissue okay. paper volume we are exporting, yes. So, was there any uh, rupee but depreciation factor? Having fact said that it is growing at double digits, Indian market is still relatively small. Okay. And do we see that ratio going up, sir, from 50% total re revenues from tissue? Because I believe that garners more margins compared to the writing side of the business? Yes. Tissue, tissue will uh, form a larger part and now we are in the process of uh, making investment in increasing our pulping capacity. So over the next 15-18 months we will be uh, adding uh, further pulp capacity which will reduce our dependence on imported pulp and also allow us to set up, uh, add to our paper, tissue paper capacity. Okay, so you're suggesting you will be fully backward integrated now going ahead? That's right. We, have, we are already 85, 90% fully in backward integrated. Going forward, we will become further backward integrated. Okay. And we also add uh, tissue paper capacity. All right. Before I let you go, uh, sir, you'd also uh, stated that you would look to divest your non-core assets, which also include some land and your 1% stake in Century Textiles. Is there any update on that? No, there is no no movement in that area. Uh, as we mentioned to you, that HIL investment is a strategic investment. Century, we are open to disinvest. However, we will wait for, we are, there is no great hurry. The company is already debt free. There is no great hurry for us to disinvest. As and when we feel the price is right, we shall disinvest. Okay, so we'll let you go on that note, Mr. Patricia. Thanks a lot for joining us and all the best for FI20. Thank you. Well, that's the management of Orion paper. The numbers looked good. Uh, according to him, operating performance, the margins, of course, on year-on-year -year basis, they have improved. And even if you look at the bottom line for the full year, profits have come in at 101 versus almost 50 crore. But this is a counter nearage. I think it's not done too much. The stock price has for only fallen, I think, 24 to 25% this year as well. Yeah, but selectively, some of the paper companies have done well. Samit, just before we thank you, I mean, uh, any... Uh, you know, the, the point would be whether or not some of these companies can do well going ahead. And I think we'll just come back to Samir Kalra with that question too, whether as to whether some of the paper companies can do well going ahead or no. That's an important conversation to have. It's a small space, but it's gotten the imagination of a few active investors. Uh, however, uh, just before we do that and before we hit the break as well, I think it's important to put 
a spotlight on some charts with Hemen. Um, Lena, over to you. What are the charts that we're talking about? Well, I think we're going to talk about two Hemen, right? We're going to talk about Hindustan Unilever one and DV's Labs the other one. Hindustan Unilever, uh, you know, what's so interesting about it? Because, you know, we've seen the stock and the kind of reaction that it has had uh, to its numbers. Uh, on Friday session, the stock was, in fact, down 1.7%. Today as well, though the numbers were not bad, the reaction has not been all that favorable. So what are we going to discuss on uh, Hindustan Unilever? See, uh, Devina, basically I'm bearish on the M entire FMCG pack and lever is right at the helm of it. Now, just a couple of things. Over here, price has made a higher high. I think that's very apparent. If you look at the MACD, it's made a lower top. Plus, we have a crossover sell. Uh, we are taking support on this average line, have been for the last couple of years. We have broken that. and. We are just on the cusp of taking support. Uh, if this is the weekly chart, then this is a 55-week exponential moving average. So one, you have a crossover sell by the mechanical indicators. Two, you have negative divergence. Three, we broke on a demand line. And this is very interesting. 1650, the level we haven't closed below on the weekly and monthly for the last two and a half years. So frankly speaking, lever is on the cusp of a breakdown. We are seeing a topping out pattern. And a close below 1650 would confirm whatever negativity we are anticipating mm. or which is on the anvil and this is the logic and plus yes you, you have the stochastic also giving you a crossover sell followed by negative divergence so at least four or five technical reasons why we think Hindustan lever is stoppish is setting to peak out and is going to give a breakdown okay so while you're talking about the price levels how far down if you see that breakdown happening uh, on the basis of those triggers how far down can it go there is one small possibility we'll take support on this level given an unsustainable bounce back but talking about price levels below 1650 i think we should be seeing uh, 1580 and 1550 but this is would probably be a three month sort of a call not a very short term call okay so for three months watch out for levels of uh, sub 1600 Yes. All right, on HUL. And the other one is DV's lab. We could have that chart as well. Uh, while we spoke about HUL and, and the negative uh, triggers there on the technical charts, uh, let's talk about what's happening with DV's lab. I believe there is a double top formation that's coming about there. Yes, Devina. Now, the thing is, so we have a distribution pattern going on. This is DV's lab. Uh, technically speaking, we are in the pro process of forming a double top. We do not have a confirmed double top. Price went to this level. We came down. We've gone and tested the earlier high. Whenever we break this valley low, that is when you have a confirmation of the double top. But it looks like happening. And why does it look like happening? Once again, we are getting top heavy. We are forming what looks like a possible rounding top. Plus, we have a crossover sale. Price has made a higher high. Indicators have made a lower top. And after the lower top, we are seeing a crossover sale. Similar scenario, look at the price over here. Look at the price over here and look at this. So we have negative case. divergence, crossover sales, distribution, rounding top, plus a possible double top pattern. We get confirmed once again on a break of this low. Which is what price? Oh, that should be something around 1639. 1639, yeah. break of it on the downside, yeah. confirms the double top, top formation, top. Yeah. and which could lead to a further downside further on DV's lab. So both DV's and HUL looking slightly more topish, and uh, several technical indicators suggesting that we could actually see a further downside on both of these counters. I mean, thanks a lot Thank for you. that. Uh, those are some charts that we've discussed, but it's time for a very short break right here on Countdown. Uh, we're on the other side, we'll get you the Fab Four stocks of the day at 3.15 p.m. We'll tell you what dealing rooms are recommending and some closing strategies. Strategies.